Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Relationships. They make up every human interaction and activity in our lives. Not only are they just a part of life, God made them integral into who we are. In God's Word, we find the ultimate guide in navigating conflict, relating to others, repairing broken relationships, and letting go of your past. Let's dive deep into the wisdom of God and get real. Well, good morning. If you're here with us for the first time, I want to introduce myself. My name is Andy Mead. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm glad that you're here. If you're visiting uh, or you're joining us online, I'm glad you're part of it. And uh, we're excited about starting this new series, Get Real, talking about relationships, about becoming more authentic and getting real. And, and specifically, we're going to launch with one of the more challenging topics. How do you how do you love somebody that you don't even like? I mean, we have these people in our lives. Sometimes they're at work, sometimes they're at home, school, whatever. A number of years ago when I was working at Costco, I worked there for 10 years to help me get through school. I needed a job. And uh, I'd been there for quite a while and I transferred to uh, become a forklift driver. So I was driving the forklift in the back and doing all the stuff that forklift drivers do. And, and a manager got transferred in about a month after I had been there and for some reason, he didn't like me. He just, thought, he just thought I was, like, terrible for some reason. And so he was always picking on me all day long. And that can make a job pretty bad. If you've had that happen, a boss who's just constantly riding you. And then he decided somewhere along the line he wanted to get rid of me. So he started trying to, you know, find ways to fire me. He finally got desperate, started making things up, getting, you know, you know, getting, you know, I was being written up for things that he was just completely fabricating. I had a hard time loving this guy. I was thinking, this guy, you know, I had to start looking for another job. And, you know, fortunately, I made it through. I was able to transfer into another department at some, you know, later down the road. But when somebody, when you're in close proximity, and somebody doesn't like you, or you don't like them, it's usually both, what do you do? You know, it's just, that's so tough. That's so tough. So we're going to look at a little bit about that, because uh, you might be in that circumstance. That might be you, or certainly those things come in life. Psalm 119.18 says, Open my eyes, Lord, that I may see the wondrous things in your law. And that's how we like to approach the Bible. It's not just as words, not just kind of read it and say, well, yeah, maybe someday or in, our, in your dreams. Yeah. But these are th things that God really wants to do in our life. So we're going to just open up the service in prayer and just to ask God to really uh, open up his word to us. Okay, let's do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is a great opportunity to express our love and our, uh, and our desire to follow you. And so today we do what you ask. Open our eyes, Lord. And let us see the wondrous things in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, love is a difficult thing to do, uh, sometimes even in the best of circumstances. But we're called to love other people. So often people that are not like us, the people that are sometimes very difficult to love. Notice at the top of your outline, this verse, it says, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So it's a command. He says, listen, this is not optional. You've got to love. So <clears throat> right off the bat, we need to kind of dis determine what is the Bible we're talking about when it's saying we need to love. What is love? Because we use love pretty flippantly. You know, I love football. Football season starting. You know, that's great. Cardinals. I love the Cardinals. That's my team. <laughs> not very, you know. <laughs> I need, to, I need to increase help, increase the fan base here. <laughs> we love pizza, we love this, we love my dog. But what's, what is love? Well, there's a couple of misunderstandings. I wanted to bring those to your attention. One of the first misunderstandings is that love is a feeling. It's not. Certainly love can create feelings. We all know that. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting how 
because of the feelings. Feelings are mysterious. They change. The very same person, we can have feelings where we're all excited, and then next thing you know, we're exhausted, and then soon, we're, after that, we're expired. We're thinking, I'm done with it. Same person, because feelings, they go up, they go down. Love can cause feelings, but love is not feelings. If you're single and recently you've come out of a, a difficult relationship, maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I'm ready, if I feel ready to jump into another relationship. I don't trust my feelings, right? I don't trust my feelings. And so sometimes our feelings can actually sabotage what God wants to do in your life. Maybe he wants to bring somebody in your life. And if you're basing it on feelings, then you're not, you could miss what God, the love God wants to bring into your life. So love can cause feelings. There's, that is true. But it is not the same thing. It is not feelings. Another mis, uh, misconception is that love is uncontrollable. Like I just can't, it's just, I just fell into love. I couldn't help it. You know, and we describe it like my head is spinning and, and uh, you know, and my, my palms are sweaty. It's that, you could be describing the flu. <laughs> It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you're describing love, but it's, 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 uh, it's something we can control. That's why God says put on love. It's something we can control. He wouldn't say that if we couldn't control it. But feelings we don't necessarily control, but we can love. Well, here's two things about love. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Colossians 3 tells us, and over all these put on love which binds them together. And so you have a choice. You can choose to put those on, put on love, and it's a commitment. I'm going to decide to do that. And then two, love is a conduct. Love is a conduct. It's an action. It's, it's more than just feelings. It's something we do. Look at what John says there. He says, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. So it's something we do. A fiancé said, I love you so much, I would die for you. And the girl says, you keep saying that, but you never do. <laughs> well, something, it's more than words, right? It's more than words. What are you willing to do to show? Because when we love, we demonstrate that. It always comes out in something that we do. And so God commands us. He says, you need to love. And loving somebody is way harder when they're not like you, when they're different from you, when they have a different political view from you, when they, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people we don't like because they don't look like us, they don't smell, we don't like the way they smell, we don't like the way they talk, we don't like their accent, we don't like the way they dress. And the world's filled with people that are difficult to love, right? And yet God says, I want you to love them. I want you to love them. How do we do that? Well, let me give you five ways real quick. Number one, experience God's love for yourself. This is important because first we've got to have love in us. You can't really give love out if we don't have it in us. And not everybody has that. That's not a given. So we experience it. Notice, not just understand, yeah, God loves me, which is true. And if you know that, I'm thankful for that. But that's not enough. It's God loves me, I know, but I also feel it down here. Notice there what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart, living within you as you trust him. May your roots go deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel, circle that, feel and understand, circle that, those two words, feel, understand, how long, wide, deep, and high his love really is. And experience this love for yourselves. Now, it's important to feel love so that you can give love. Not everybody has love in them. That's why they're so unlovely. I mean, there's a, there's, the people that are hardest to love are the unlovely, right? People that don't deserve it. They're the ones that need it the most, but they're the ones that are hardest to give it to. And so when we experience love for ourselves, we can start to see past that. We can start to say, man, these people, they're, they're, they're hurt. And that's true. Hurt people hurt people. When you're hurt, when you've experienced hurt and you can't resolve it and you let that thing fester in there, you end up living out a life where you're hurting others. Sometimes you don't even know you're doing it. I talked to a guy a couple of weeks ago. I was saying, you seem angry. And he goes, I'm not angry. Did I say I was angry? I told you I'm not angry. I mean, he didn't even see it. I'm thinking, oh, okay, back down. I guess you're not angry, you know. 
Sometimes we don't even know how bad we're hurting somebody else. And so first, making sure you're not walking around where you're super needy because you haven't got God's love from us. We all need love from one another. But listen, you cannot get from other people what God has intended to give to you, which is his love. That's where it always begins, where you understand it and where you deeply feel it. God loves me. When I was driving here to church this morning, I just wanted to remind myself, God, remind me of those moments when you just poured your love into me, where you rescued me out of difficult places. And I just reminded myself, God, you love me. And that's one of the ways that we're able to then love others like they need to be loved because people that are unlovely are hard to love, right? The truth is you might be one of these people that has not experienced God's love. Maybe you had a lot of pain in your life. Somebody's hurt you. You had injustice take place in your life. And so you've, you have that unresolved. It's undealt with. It's festering down there. And listen, you cannot love others like you need to if you don't deal with that. Because you can't hold on to resentment and anger and bitterness for one person and really love other people like you need to. You can't love your kids like you need to if you're still holding on to the way your dad or your mom mistreated you. You can't love your spouse like you need to if you're still reacting the way some girlfriend treated you or some boyfriend. That's a divided heart, and a divided heart can't love fully. And so you love, you experience God's love, and God wants to do that. And you say, how do you do that? Well, it's not a one-time thing. Certainly, I'm going to ask you to pray with me at the end of the service. I'm going to ask you to receive God's love into your life. But it's also a daily feeling, a daily feeling. This is, I kind of see the service kind of like, I'm like an ambulance driver. I grab you and throw you in the ambulance and then take you to the hospital, which is our small groups. That's where you get filled week after week. Not just in our small groups, but in your own, your own, your own time with God. But just... And, God, show me once again how much you love me. Number two, forgive others who've hurt you. Forgive others who've hurt you. And we've all had that. Colossians 3.13 says, Forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And so forgiving others is important. You know, it's saying, I'm not going to hold on to that stuff. I'm not going to just nurse that stuff and think about it and 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 and, you know sometimes we need to actually go and resolve that maybe with a counselor we have uh we have prayer ministers that you know in our in our church at the end of the service you can come up and and get prayer we have specific small groups that help with forgiveness sometimes you need something unlocked if you held on to that for a long time sometimes it doesn't get it, it it it's got its hooks in you it doesn't go away real easy you might be thinking, yeah, I'd like to let go of that, but that's, that's a good first step. doesn't mean that it happened. And so you take the steps that you need to do to say, hey, I am going to resolve that. Statistics say that one out of three women will be abused in their lifetime. One out of every seven men will be abused in their lifetime. Th- things happen. Life is difficult, and there's a lot of harshness out there. But Part of what God wants us to do is not carry that into our relationships. We let that go. Number three, establish healthy boundaries. Establish healthy boundaries. Now, when you have a piece of physical property, like your house or your apartment, you have a boundary around that. It's, there's, there's a boundary that this is mine. This is, uh, this is uh, my responsibility. My, I'm, in, I'm, I'm supposed to control this. Even if you don't own it, you were given the uh, the responsibility, this is yours. And, we, and sometimes it even has a fence around it. This is mine. That's not mine. I'm not responsible for that. I'm responsible for this. Well, boundaries in relationships, the, the, there's two people. They're in, they're, there's an interpersonal relationship, but there's still boundaries. There's this is mine. I'm responsible for this. I'm not responsible for that. Sometimes that gets blurred for people. Sometimes it's, it seems so clear when it's a piece of physical property, and yet it gets blurry when it's a personal relationship. But yet we need to make sure and have clear boundaries there as well. That's healthy. That creates a place of safety, a place of, of, uh, of respect for one another. And so having healthy boundaries is very important. When we cross over somebody's personal boundary, 
The Bible refers to that as trespassing. We use that in referring to physical as well, right? Hey, that's a trespass. You're not supposed to come on here. Well, that's what Jesus says. He says in the Lord's Prayer, he says, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He's saying that some there, somewhere there was a violation of my personal space, of, of, of what's supposed to be mine, or there's a violation of God's law and God's, wh- wh- how we're supposed to live before the Lord. And so we need to have these boundaries. Now, sometimes other people are very poor at keeping their boundaries. And it like, like uh, if you have a neighbor who uh, d- lets their leaves fall on the ground and they won't clean them up, and then the wind blows, and all of a sudden their leaves are on your property. You know, they got trash in their yard, and their trash ends up in your yard. And you're thinking... This is not my trash. This is their trash. And that gets pretty frustrating. And again, the importance of having boundaries. It's saying, hey, this is, and if you're going to have, if you're going to love somebody uh, th- and you're going to be in relationship with them, you've got to erect those. You've got to say, this is, this, is the, this is a boundary here. This is, and, and let me just say that forgiveness, because we just talked about that, is not the same as restoration. Forgiveness, if somebody comes into your house and they have muddy shoes and they walk all over your carpet, you can forgive them. You should say, dang, man, whether they did it on purpose or not, you can say, I forgive you. That doesn't mean they're restored. To be restored means, hey, go get a bucket of soapy water and clean that up. <laughs> now you're restored. Now we're back in good, good steads together. So there is a difference there. And part of boundaries is recognizing that I'm, if there's, uh, when there's been a trespass, there needs to be restoration. And, and make that clear. Here is the boundary. Jesus said, forgive us our trespasses. And so that is something we want to offer. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. What does that mean? Well, Christ went to the cross he died for us, set us free, but not all of us walk in that freedom. So he's reminding us, he's saying, you have freedom that you're supposed to be walking in because of what Christ did for you. Christ set you free, so walk in that freedom. What kind of freedom? Well, one of those kinds of freedoms is freedom of our own responsibility. I can choose. I can choose how I'm going to react to other people. I get to cho- decide that, not other people. And, and also, I'm expected to. I'm expected to make those those decisions and so if somebody bugs me i choose how i respond if somebody gets on my nerves they i get sour feelings i'm responsible for how i manage and deal with those feelings so that i act in a loving way and setting up boundaries is we're talking about fences not walls it's important that we don't just erect walls where nobody can come in c.s lewis talks about the difference between Uh, emotional walls and just these boundaries we're talking about. He said this, he says, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will certainly be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to be sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Lock it up in the safe or the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, emotionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable the only place outside of heaven where you can be safe from all the dangers of love is hell so you don't want to fall into that certainly we want to keep our relationships open and part of that real is coming to the recognition is i have choices if you see yourself as not having choices then you find yourself falling in to depression one of the great causes of of depression, which is at really epidemic levels, according to mental health experts in our country, is because we don't see ourselves as having choices. Sometimes people are raised in homes where they they feel like they didn't have a lot of choices. No matter what, they couldn't. Dad was always upset. No matter what, somebody always yelled at them. And so they, they just feel like they didn't have choices. Then they become adults, and in their relationships, they make no choices. They feel like they're helpless, like they're victims. And so everything's coming at them, and all they are is a person who can't make choices. This is not accurate. The freedom that Christ fought for you is is that you can make choices and that you should. You decide how you're going to react to somebody who is hurting you, who's treating you poorly, who is trespassing boundaries. You make that choice. Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control is a boundary term means I control me. 
I control me. I don't have to worry. You know, I can't control other people. Self-control, not other control. Back years ago when I used to do more marriage counseling, I would, you know, have a couple in front of me, and I'd say, okay, what's going on? Well, she is always angry, and she's always so controlling. Why are you so angry? Why are you so controlling? Well, he's so irresponsible. Why are you so irresponsible? Well, she's always getting in my face. If she didn't do that, I wouldn't be irresponsible. Why are you always getting in his face? It's just back. It's like, it's like the U.S. Open or something. They're back and forth. The problem is nobody's taking responsibility for themselves. They're blaming the other person for their responses. This is why I do it. It's because of you. You're making me so angry. You're doing this. Self-control is what the Spirit gives us. The self-control. I don't, I control myself. I don't control. See, self-control is already very difficult. Other control is impossible. So I'd, I'd resign that baby right off the bat. Just say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to work on self-control because that's tough enough and that's all God says he wants to help me with. Self-control. So I don't, I can recognize how much God loves me, feel that, forgive others, set up boundaries. Number four, you think loving thoughts. You see, God will allow unloving people to be put in your life so that you can grow in love. How would you grow in love? How do you grow in peace if you're always living like in an idyllic little serene lake? It's just you and the deer that you feed from your hands. You don't learn peace that way, right? You learn peace when there's chaos and difficulty at work. Well, it's the same thing with true, with love. We learn love by uh, when God allows love unlovable people in our lives. That's how we learn to grow in love, and this is what God does. And uh, Jesus said this. He said, do you think you deserve credit for merely loving those who love you? He goes, everybody does that. Even the godless do that. And if you do good only to those who do good, is that so wonderful? Even sinners do that much. And so how do we love others? Well, we focus on the pain that they're in. You see, hurt people do hurt people, as I said. And so you think, you know, these people, they, this person is hurting me. They're, they're hurting me because they're so hurt. They have so much stuff in their life. And you start changing the way you're viewing it. Instead of it's just all about me, it's all a personal attack. You start thinking outside of yourself. And you don't let your feelings just control you. you, you, you see, your thoughts really control your feelings. Your th feelings are kind of out of control. You can't control that. But you can a little bit if you change your way of thinking. As you start to change your way of thinking, your feelings are like a caboose. They start to follow. So you change the way you're thinking. Instead of just getting into this mindset, you know, and just telling yourself and talking to yourself, I, you know, like if you're miserable in your marriage, you know, and you, oh, how can I, I should have married that other person in, that I met in, that I knew in high school. And I'd be happy. But I, mean, I got a bum deal. I didn't know what I was marrying when I walked up the aisle. And really what you're doing is it's just a pity party. You're just licking your wounds and you keep talking like that. And what happens is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I've seen it many, many times. Starts out, yeah, well, she's so irritating. Next thing you know, I'm talking, same guy. Oh, yeah, she's just a witch. Oh, wow. Well, things have changed, huh? Just in a few weeks. Maybe you have something to do with that. You know, and the next thing you know, she's horrible, and I can't stand her. If you keep thinking that, you're playing in a, probably the biggest role of all, and that thing falling apart. And so you change the way you think. You don't, you stop. If you gave half the energy to the time uh, you give to thinking about if things were different and fantasizing about, how, about if things could be different and how bad your situation is, to actually thinking positive thoughts, you're your situation would change significantly. Certainly your feelings would change because your feelings follow your thought life. So your thought life is very important. I love this verse here in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, and this is kind of an amplified version of that. It says, love always protects. Even when I feel like abandoning you, I will protect our love. Love always trusts. Even though I feel transgressed by you, I will learn to trust you. Love always hopes, even though I feel like there is no future, I'll look forward to a future with you. 
And love always perseveres. Even when every bone in my body says I want to run and hide, I'm going to stick through this with you. Now, this is my prayer for the vineyard, for our, that our church would treasure putting love on, saying we're going to certainly allow God's love to uh, come upon us. We're going to learn to forgive. We're going to set up boundaries. But we're going to take control over our thoughts. We're not going to just let that run amok. We can choose what we're going to think about. And we can choose positive thoughts. And we want to be authentic. It's easy to have, be pretentious, but we, we value being authentic. Let's be authentic before God, before others, and watch our feelings change. Number five, I must begin acting in a loving way. I begin acting in a loving way. You say, Andy, if I don't feel love and I act loving, isn't that being hypocritical? No, it's not. You are acting lovingly in advance. You don't feel that way yet, but you're going to act it because you know the feelings will come. The feelings will come. So it's kind of like loving in faith. Jesus did this, you know, in Hebrews 12. The Bible says he was looking at one of the greatest acts of love humanity would ever know. He was going to go to the cross. He was going to be crucified for the sins of humanity, what you and I have done, and all of humanity. He didn't do that. We did it, and yet he's facing that. Somebody needs to pay for that sin. And he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't feel like it. You may have heard about the prayer in Gethsemane where he says, I don't want to do this. That's how he felt. I don't want to do this. But he did it anyways. The Bible says there in Hebrews 12, he says that despising the shame, not wanting to go and do this, he lovingly went to the cross. See, he, 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 he acted in loving ways even though he didn't feel like it. That's a good model, model for us. We can be like that. We can act in a loving way even when we don't necessarily feel like it. You see, if you wait, if you're a husband, you go, well, I'll be considerate to my wife when I feel like it. Well, listen, f fellas, <laughs> hell will freeze over before you feel like it. <laughs> you don't want to wait that long. <coughs> Ladies, if you say, well, I'll act romantic towards my husband when I feel like it, uh, that's going to be a while. <laughs> so you, you act in loving ways even though you don't feel like it. Because when we think and we act certain ways, our feelings are sure to follow. Luke 6, here Jesus is talking about loving in difficult situations and putting and doing it in action. He says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Four, four things, not easy to do, certainly. But these are actions. You don't feel like it, somebody's being hateful, hurtful, they're, 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 they're not respecting your boundaries, they're not respecting who you are, and he says, you step into that. Psychologists call, talk about this as assertiveness. You decide how things are going to go down. They can do what they want, so they're mean to you, you don't necessarily respond that way. Four things to do when people hurt you. First, he says, love them. I love them. And on a personal level, sometimes that means that we just overlook Overlook their faults, loving our enemies. Second, do good. You look for ways to be positive. How can I be proactive in this thing? You know, they're, they're saying, they're criticizing me. I'm not going to respond in the same way. Now, that sometimes it takes imagination. You have to think outside the box. Maybe that's just the best thing to do is be silent at that time. But you look for positive ways, offer practical help. Speaking positively, not criticizing back when it says, bless those who curse you. And then, and then fourth, pray for those who mistreat you. See, grace and love is really what brings change. That's what God does to us. He showers us when we don't deserve it with grace and love. And we change. That's what changes the human condition. You see, when you put your faith in Christ, God begins a work. He begins a work. You allow him, okay, I want you to begin a work. That's what it means to be born again. It means you say, God, you have permission to begin a work of love and grace in my life to start to begin to change. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It means you allow God to begin to change you through his grace and his love. And this is what helps other people change. So we pray for them. Listen, if you 
do the, the last one first, you pray for them, the other three will be more manageable. Sometimes that can be challenging if you're really self-reflecting, you're going, ah, I could grow in this. And you know what, we're all in the same boat. What I want to do is just take a moment and just close now. We're going to close in, a, in, in prayer. We're just going to kind of commit these things. What do you pray about when you're praying about somebody who's not that loving? What do you pray about the things we just talked about? Uh, God, help me to be more, help me to experience your love for myself. Help me to see the, the deficits of love in that person. God, help me to forgive. Help me to be that kind of person that uh, uh, understands self-control. Grow that in me, Lord. Help me not to have a pity party. Help me to not be the victim. Not be so helpless. To be a, somebody who just doesn't react. To demonstrate, think and to demonstrate loving things. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Well, Lord, we just come to you, Lord, and just take this moment. Come, Lord. The things we talked about today we know are so difficult they're really impossible and so God right now come fill us up without that this whole Bible study has been a waste of our time we need your infilling we need you to speak into our life to help us not just to know you love us but to feel it if you're here this morning and you don't know and feel the love of God, that's why you're here. He wants to speak to you. He wants to move on you. Maybe you were invited. Maybe you got a flyer in the mail. There could have been a lot of different reasons. Maybe you saw the sign on the interstate. But God knew you'd be here so he could tell you he loves you. That you matter to him. And so right now I'm going to ask you to take that first step in your journey where you say, God, begin to show me. I want to start that journey. Begin to show me your love and your grace in my life. Would you do that right now where you're at? Just in your heart, in your mind, you can whisper it, you can pray it out loud, however you want. Say, God, begin the journey in me. I want to experience. Would you pray that? Say, I want to experience your love and your grace. Forgive me, Lord. And out of that, I'll use, I'll be able to forgive others. Love on me, Lord, so that I can show greater love to others. Maybe you have some resentment in your life. When I was talking about that, you have some undealt with stuff right now. Just, would you say, God, I'm going to, I'm going to just kind of open my, that part of my life up, that painful part, part where the feelings are so tender, so hurt. God, would you touch that area? Bring healing. Say, God, I forgive. I forgive. And you just forgive them. Maybe you say them by name. Maybe you speak the offense. I forgive that. And then every time it comes up, you just declare that because you control your thoughts. Say, I forgive. Doesn't mean everything's restored, but I forgive because I my relationships are too important. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.